I've been thinking about this a lot, especially since talking to Richard Dawkins. It's like, okay, the postmodernist types, going back way before Derrida and Foucault, maybe back to Nietzsche, who I admire greatly, by the way, says, God is dead. It's like, okay. But Nietzsche said, God is dead, and we have killed him, and we'll not find enough water to wash away all the blood. So that was Nietzsche. He's no fool. He's got a way with words. He certainly does. And so then you think, okay, well, we killed the transcendent. Well, what does that mean for science? Well, it frees it up because all that nonsense about a deity is just the idiot superstition that stops the scientific um, what process from moving forward. That's basically the new atheist claim, something like that. It's like, wait a second. Do you believe in the transcendent if you're a scientist? And the answer is, well, not only do you believe in it, you believe in it more than anything else, because if you're a scientist, you believe in what objects to your theory more than you believe in your theory. Now, we got to think that through very carefully. So your theory describes the world, and as far as you're concerned, your description of the world is the world. But because you're a scientist, you think, well, even though that's my description of the world and that's what I believe, there's something beyond what I believe. And that's the object. And so I'm going to throw my theory against the object and see where it'll break. And then I'm going to use the evidence of the break as a source of new information to revitalize my theory. So as a scientist, you have to posit the existence of the ontological transcendent before you can move forward at all. But more, you have to posit that contact with the ontological transcendent, annoying though it is because it upsets your apple cart, is exactly what will in fact set you free. So then you accept the proposition that there is a transcendent reality and that the that contact with that transcendent reality is redemptive in the most fundamental sense, because if it wasn't, well, why would you bother making contact with it? You're going to make everything worse or better. Why does the uh, contact with the transcendent set you free as a scientist? Because you assume that you assume, I mean, freedom in the most fundamental sense. It's like, well, freedom from want, freedom from disease, freedom from ignorance, right? That it informs you. So it's the, the logos in it. of science. It is definitely that. Yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the direction, let's say, the directionality of science. That's a narrative direction, not a scientific direction. And then the question is, what is the narrative? Well, it posits a transcendent reality. It posits that the transcendent reality is corrective. It posits that our knowledge structures should be regarded with humility. It posits that you should bow down in the face of, of the transcendent evidence. And you have to take a vow. You know this as a scientist. You have to take a vow to follow that path if you're going to be a real scientist. It's like the truth, no matter what. And that means you posit the truth as a redemptive force. Well, what does redemptive mean? Well, why bother with science? Well, so people don't starve, so people can move about more effectively, so life can be more abundant, right? So it's all ensconced within an underlying ethic. So the, re the reason I, I was saying that while we were talking about belief in God, it's like, this is a very complicated topic, right? Do you believe in a transcendent reality? See, so okay, now let's say you buy the argument I just made on the natural front, and you say, yeah, yeah, that's just nature. That's not God. And then I'd say, well, what makes you think you know what nature is? Like, see, the th problem with that argument is that it, it already presumes a materialist, a reductionist materialist objective view of what constitutes nature. But if you're a scientist, you're going to think, well, in the final analysis, I don't know what nature is. I certainly don't know its origin or destination point. I don't know its teleology. I'm really ignorant about nature. And so when I say it's nothing but nature, I shouldn't mean it's nothing but what I understand nature to be. So I could say, will we have a fully reductionist account of cognitive processes? And the answer to that is yes, but by the time we do that, our understanding of matter will have transformed so much that what we think of as reductionist now won't look anything like yes. what we think of reductionism now. Matter isn't dead dust. I don't know what it is. I have no idea what it is. Matter is what matters. There's a definition. That's a very weird definition. But the notion that we have, you know, that if you're a reductionist, a materialist reductionist, that you can reduce the complexity of what is 
to your assumptions about the nature of matter. Yeah. That's not a scientific Your specific limited human assumptions of this century, of this week, that, so you, you in, in, in some sense, without God in this complicated, big definition we're talking about, the there's no humility, or it's there's less- There's not enough. There's less likely to be, or rather science can err in taking a trajectory away from humility. Well, without something much more powerful than an uh, individual human. Yeah, well then, and we know, you know, the Frankenstein story comes out of that instantly. And <laughs> that's a good story for the current times. It's like, you, you're you playing around with making new life? You bloody well better sh make sure you have your arrows pointed up. 